requests. And we're just going to be going through these slides for the request for proposal overview training. And um, and we will uh, hopefully address any questions you guys have. So this is the FY23 Listos California Tribal Grant LI program request for proposal overview training January 24th, 2024. So on the agenda today, we're going to be talking about the LISOS grant unit and contact information, the program overview, the purpose of the grant, el the eligibility criteria, funding for the LI program, programmatic components, reporting requirements, and proposal rating sheet, and a checklist of required Cal OES forms. LISOS grant unit and contact information. The LISOS Grant Unit is responsible for the overall grant management of the LISOS California Statewide Grant LS Program, LISOS California Target Grant LG Program, LISOS California Tribal Grant LI Program, LISOS California CERT Support Grant LC Program, and LISOS California Youth Development Grant LY Program. Questions concerning the RFP, the process or programmatic issues must be submitted in writing by email to listosgrant at caloes.ca.gov. CalOES staff cannot assist the applicant with the actual preparation of their proposal. CalOES can only respond to technical questions about the RFP during the period of time between the publication date and the completion of the RFP process. Program Overview. The FY 2023-2024 Budget Act included a $25 million ongoing general fund appropriation to the Cal OES. $1 million was given to the Listos California Trent Grant LI program via competitive process. Applicants can apply for up to $2,250,000. Grant subaward performance period June 1st through 2000. 24 through December 31st, 2025. Submit. This is an important day. Submission deadline is Monday, March 4th, 2024 by 5 p.m. via email at listosgrants at caloes.ca.gov. The purpose of the grant of the LI program is to support federally recognized tribes located in California that serve populations in areas at moderate to high risk from natural hazards. Tribal governments can walk can work independently independently with other tribal governments or with local CBOs to provide disaster preparedness information and resources to vulnerable communities. The goal of this work is intended to increase their community's disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation capabilities. Vulnerable com communities include, but are not limited to, people with disabilities, elders, older adults, areas with geographically isolated individuals or families, low broadband subscriptions, and households with limited English proficiency. Eligibility criteria for a proposal to be eligible to compete for funding, i.e. read and rated, all of the following conditions must be met. Applicants must be a federally recognized tribe with administrative offices located in California. One proposal must be emailed to listosgrants at caloes.ca.gov by 5 p.m. on Monday, March 4, 2024. Proposals must be attached as a single document, e.g. a PDF, for example, and email should identify, uh, should identify the name of the RFP in the subject line, example, LI, RFP, My Brother's House Organization. Funding for the LI program. A million dollars is available for the LI program for the grant subaward performance period. Applicants may apply for up to $250,000. Subrecipients may request an advance of up to 25% of their awarded funds. There is no match required for the LI program. Programmatic components, managing subgranted funds to local CBOs, lease those California grant program materials, communication requirements, training, establish and implement a community engagement approach, 
identify gaps and propose solutions. Host a conversation to identify emergency preparedness needs of the community for integration into the local emergency plans and capture stories of impacts. We're going to cover all these points right now. So managing a sub granted funds to local CBOs. The sub recipient may sub grant funds to a local CBOs or provide disaster information as resources to vulnerable communities and have the ability to serve as a fiscal sponsor for the sub recipient. The number of local CBOs selected should be informed by the regional picture of the communities the sub recipient intends to reach. These local CBOs will engage in the engage the greatest possible number of vulnerable members to reach the statewide objective of connecting more than 1 million Americans, Californians, not Americans, sorry, Californians to culturally and linguistically competent support. The Listos California Grant Program Materials and Communication Requirement. Listos California branded material is required and will be provided by Cal OES. The subrecipient chooses to produce their own materials with with if the subrecipient chooses to produce their own material with Listos California grant program funds, they must receive prior approval from the Cal OES, including the Listos California logo. Subrecipients must respond within five days business days to cal to all cal oes required programmatic requests training the subrecipient must incorporate the materials and resource developed for the provided developed for and provided by the listos california grant program in any emergency preparedness response recovery and mitigation training conducted with grant funding the subrecipient also must attend monthly Listos California instructional training offered by Cal OES or a Cal OES designated vendor during the six months of the grant sub award performance period. Attend monthly training classes meetings to receive updates and resources throughout the grant sub award performance period. Establish and implement a community engagement approach. Tribal members will create and create and implement a community engagement approach to educate on disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation capabilities. Each tribe must organize their community to establish a tailored approach, which will ensure the community one is knowledgeable about the about what to do during a disaster and consider engaging community partners such as faith-based communities, schools, community centers, etc. To have an emergency preparedness materials and access to information before a disaster hits. Three is clear on the steps to take to increase their community's disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation capabilities and keep themselves, their families, and community safe. And four shares final approach and results with Cal OES least of California support team. Identify gaps and propose solutions. The subrecipient must identify gaps raised by community input in the peer to peer engagement and organizing process and per and propose solutions to strengthen local county emergency plans. Share the recommendations on identified gaps and solutions with the Cal OES Listos California program support team. Host a conversation to identify emergency preparedness needs of the community for in integration into the local emergency plans. The subrecipient must host a conversation conversation to identify disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation needs of the community for integration into local emergency plans as a joint effort with local leaders across sectors, including and the county emergency manager. Share outcomes of the conversation with the Cal OES Listos California su support team. Capture stories of impact. The subrecipient must capture stories of impact, highlighting outcomes and results of the local strategies and connections made as part of this effort that illustrates the purpose and intent of the LI program and provide the stories to the Cal OES Listos California support team. These stories may be submitted in writing, in written articles, videos, and photos. Please ensure that formal permission is granted for all stories. 
reporting requirement. These are five progress reports required for the program. You guys can see the chart below and, and kind of just follow the dates, um, but these are the final report period dates. Engagement reports. Engagement reports are based upon a direct public engagement activity. Subrecipients are required to submit data directly through an online database immediately after an engagement activity or training commences, or no later than the, than the end of each month. This, this is a competitive grant process, meaning that your application will be ranked in comparison to all the other applications received. Each of the above categories contains questions assigned a point value. The point scale is divided into five columns labeled one, two, three, four, and five. The applicant's response to each question is evaluated for the following criteria. Absent. The response does not address the specific question or a response is not provided. Unsatisfactory. The response does not completely address the question. The information presented does not provide a good understanding of applicants intent, does not give the detailed information requested by the RFP and or does not adequately support the proposal or the intent of the program. Satisfactory. The response addresses the question and provides a good understanding of the applicant's intent. The response adequately supports the proposal and the intent of the program. Above average. The response is above average and provides a clear and detailed understanding of the applicant's intent. The response presents a persuasive argument that supports the proposal and the intent of the program. And finally, excellent the the response is outstanding with clear detailed and relevant information the response presents a compelling argument that supports the proposal and the intent of the program so it's important you guys are addressing the questions in the rfp so you guys can score high in this competitive process um, proposal required documentation so this is a checklist and it's provided to ensure that complete proposal is submitted to cal oes uh, as you can see most of these form most of these uh forms are provided uh, and will be provided on our uh, web page recommendation for award final funding decisions are made by the director of cal oes funding decisions are based on the following the rank score of the proposal, consideration of priorities or geographical distribution specific to the RFP, and prior negative administrative and programmatic performance, if, if applicable. Once a decision has been made, the applicant will be notified in writing. Those not selected will receive a, re a denial letter and information on the appeal process. Proposal submission. The proposal package must be received electronically no later than 5 p.m. on Monday, March 4, 2024 to the listos grants at caloes.ca.gov email. And these are reminders, important reminders. Questions concerning the RFP, the process, or writing programmatic issues must be submitted in writing by email to the listos grants at caloes.ca.gov email. Cal OES staff cannot assist the applicant with the actual preparation of their proposal. Cal OES can only respond to technical questions about the RFP during the period of time between the publication date and the completion of the RFP process. This concludes the Lisa California tribal grant li program rfp training next up is the grant sub award proposal training give me a second i'm gonna
So while you're working on that, um, there is one question in the chat here. It says, um, does there have to be subrecipients or would the would they apply tribes to be considered or would would applying tribes be considered a subrecipient? Um, so the applying tribe applying would be considered the subrecipient, but um, if you're awarded funds, you can subgrant out to second tier subrecipients if that's what you'd like to do, but it's not a requirement. Okay, so we're we're ready, right, guys? You guys can see my screen. We're on the sure right can. page. Okay, so now we're going to go over a couple slides that'll help you go through the grant sub award proposal process. We're going to provide you with some guidance on the components that are required of a proposal, and we're going to review the forms on the RFP checklist that I just referenced a moment ago and familiar, familiarize you with some of the tools that are available for you guys. The process of submitting a proposal begins with the request for proposal being released. This is our competitive process. Within the request for proposal, you'll find fund source information the background of the program, requirements and expected deliverables and instructions on how to apply. So where do you find the request for proposal? It can be found on the Cal OES website at caloes.ca.gov. And on the upper right hand corner, you'll click on initiatives and from the drop down menu, select search for grants. Once you're on the search for grant landing landing page, there are a couple of ways to search. You can find the least those California RFPs by scrolling down on this page, or you can use each search or you can use the search box. I like to use the search box when I know which request for proposal I'm looking for. You may also use the you may type the name of the program in the box, or if you know the two letter acronym, you may type that in instead. Although we're, although we're talking about a request for proposal, I'd like to draw your attention to the mailing list. When the Cal OES releases a request for proposal, our competitive process for funding, we send an email notification to anyone who has signed up for our emailing list. Please know the only time we send an email is when we release a new request for proposal. We're sending a solicitation to fill a position for one of our advisory bodies or when we post a public meeting notice. If you're not signed up, we strongly encourage you to do so so you can receive these important notices. Cal OES released the Listos California Tribal Grant Program request for proposals on January 8th. And applicants have approximately eight weeks to put the proposal packet together from that date. Once complete, applicants will need to email a copy of the proposal packet to the Listos Grant Unit at listosgrants at caloes.ca.gov. All right, let's talk about the request for proposal or RFP itself. The, R the RFP has three parts. Part one is what you have to do. It explains the Public Records Act submission deadline, eligibility, grant sub-award performance period, funding, and programmatic requirements. Part two refers to policies or administrative requirements and includes references to the subrecipient handbook components that are required with your proposal. Policies concerning the budget, administrative requirements, and required or additional forms that may apply to your proposal. And part three is a checklist that includes a list of the documents that are required with proposal and links to the most current forms. This is an example of what the checklist looks like. It includes all of the required components and links to each form. Under the additional form section, these forms may or may not be required depending on what you have in your budget. For example, if you do not have any out of state travel, you will you won't need to include this with your formal with your form. You won't need to include this form with your proposal. There are eight forms that are required with every request for proposal, regardless of your program type. Please note that most programs will require additional forms. 
So read your request for proposal thoroughly. In the next slides, we're going to tell you about some of the more common mistakes that we find with these eight forms so that you know what we're looking for and when we review your proposals. You can find these forms at the at the very end of the RFP in the checklist section with the hyperlink to each form. But first, here are a few helpful reminders. One, read the entire request for proposal to understand what is required of the program. Number two, please know that all forms have instructions. So if you have a question about a form, look at the instructions first. And if you still have a question, then email leastillsgrants at caloes.ca.gov for help. Number three, use current forms. Cal OES updates our forms often. If you're using one of our forms that you've saved like on your desktop, it's possible it may have been outdated and you'll be asked to redo the form which may delay the processing or your award if selected. OK. Let's start with the grant sub award face sheet. The instructions are on the left and the most recent version of the face sheet is on the right. A few of the most common mistakes we find on the grant sub award face sheet include one. Look at the two red arrows on the right. The last four digits of the zip code are often missing. Please be sure to go to the US Postal Service's website to look up your plus four and include that on your face sheet. Number two, the look at the arrows uh, on the left pointing to line five of the face sheet. Uh, the disaster program title needs to match the name of the program. The it needs to match the name of the program you're applying for. This can be found in the request for proposal. For example, if you're applying for the Listos California Tribal Grant LI program, then write Listos California Tribal Grant LI program on line, on line five. And then the arrow on the left pointing to line seven. Indirect costs, indirect cost rate. So the indirect cost rate, uh, <clears throat> is uh, is uh, the indirect cost rate and federally approved ICR. This is where you will indicate whether you're using the 10% de minimis rate or your agency's federally approved indirect cost rate agreement. A copy of the approved ICR negotiation agreement must be enclosed in your application if you are using a federally approved ICR. If you won't be claiming the indirect costs under this for this award, just type NA, not, not applicable. OK, so a few more common mistakes that we find on the sub on the grant sub award face sheet. These include uh, look at the two arrows that just popped up the last. Oh, we already went over this. OK, so whoop, boom. Oh, there, there you go. And those are all the arrows that I was mentioning. <laughs> OK, so this is the table that appears on the face sheet. We zoomed in so you can see it easier. This is where your funding information will go and you can find all this information in your request for proposal. Please know that the grant year and the fund source are now drop down boxes. Columns A and G can be typed and will automatically total for you. In your request for proposal in part one, section F, funding information, you'll find the information needed to correctly fill out the face sheet. This is an example of a grant subaward number. There is no need to fill in the, the subaward line area on the form requesting it. The subaward number is given once an applicant has been awarded the grant funds. And this is the grant subaward contact information form, the instructions on the left, and the most recent version of the form on the right. Here's a list of things to keep in mind. Remember to use the most updated forms from our website and don't forget to write the entire nine digit zip code the plus four numbers when when putting in the address also do not use white out to fix corrections on lines one and two make sure that one grant sub award director and the two financial officer are different they cannot be the same person on lines two and five 
make sure the number two financial officer and the number five executive director are different. They cannot be the same person. The number seven chairperson also cannot be listed again in any of the other positions numbered one through six. Leave the sub grant award number blank. This will be filled in for you if you are awarded. And lastly, please make sure the official designate this designated by the governing board on line six is the person who signs the grant oh, sub award face sheet. These are these are mistakes that we, we often send stuff back to the sub awardees for. OK, so. OK, so this is the signature authorization form. The instructions are on the left and the most recent form is on the right. When we when we review the authorization form, we compare it to the contact information form to ensure the grant sub award director and financial officer are the same authorized person. You can list alternative individuals that have the authority to sign grants and sub award director and financial officer behalf. Just like the grant sub award director and financial officer cannot be the same person, you cannot have one person be an authorized signer in both sides of the form. It's best to have at least one authorized signer for each position. If someone is unavailable and you need to request funds or make a modification, it's easy to do so when you have different authorized signers for each position. If not, there's nothing you can do until they return. If you want to change authorized signers, you must submit a grant sub award modification to Cal OES as soon as possible because it takes approximately two weeks to process. So it's important to make a modification request immediately when the change has been made internally in your organization. This is a current list of certification of assurance of a com of compliance documents we have. A common mistake is signing and submitting the wrong one. We must receive the one that is tied to the fund source of your program. The checklist in part three of the request for proposal will tell you exactly which one is needed. Another mistake is using an old version of a document. The way to ensure you have the current version is by downloading it from our website. Again, the checklist will have the link for the correct and current version. So let's let's please be sure you're reading this document in full so you know what the requirements are because when you sign this you certify that you are compliant. The red arrows, let me see, make sure the red arrows pop up for us. So the red arrows are some areas I want to bring to your attention. Number one, the subrecipient is the is the name of your agency. Please have this match what is written on the face sheet. Number two, pointing at the line, pointing at line one, uh, the applicant should complete the Cal OES program name and the sub grant and the grant sub award performance period. The grant sub award number should be left blank. Your program specialist will fill it in for you. Number three, ensure that the ensure the ensure appropriate signers have signed the document. This would be the official designee by the governing board. And number four, for federally recognized tribes and community based organization, it must be the governing board chair that signs this section. OK, the budget is normally the next document in your proposal. Forms 2106B grant subaward budget pages single fund source. These are this is the form 2106. So it has three budget cat. It has three categories. Uh, category A is personal services, personnel services. Uh, category B is operating expenses, and category C is equipment. All the all three categories must be submitted with your application, whether or not you have items in cat in the category. For example, if you do not have equipment, you can write none requested in that category but all three categories must be included in your application packet. The budget spreadsheet template will automatically add the columns on each tab. 
please show the equation. So it's important you guys show the equa equation on each line item as to how you got your total. When you guys are filling this out, it, uh, it's important that you guys put equations on each, each one and it will be automatically totaled up for you guys. The personnel category is where you want to put salary, be salaries, benefits, overtimes for people you employ at your agency. This will also be where you put your volunteer hours. The operating category is the me and potatoes of your program. This is where you'll want to put just about everything else, including rent, travel, training, office supplies, etc. The equipment category is where you'll put non-expendable property property having a useful life of more than one year and a cost of $5,000 or more per unit. So just to be clear, if you're buying six laptops at a cost of $1,000 each for a total of $6,000, you would put these laptops in the operating expenses category, not in equipment as each laptop was less than $5,000 per unit. OK, let's talk about the information we need to see on the budget page, bu budget pages. So the gold bubbles you'll see on the next few slides contain elements that need to be included in each calculation for each line item. In this example, if we have a program, if we have a program advocate position that is making four thousand dollars per month, please note that the salary can the salary cost can be shown as an hourly rate. A monthly salary or an it can be shown so it can be shown uh, as an hourly rate a monthly salary rate or an, an annual salary then we want to see the duration in this example the program advocate will be paid for 12 months which probably matches the length of the performance period and then we want to see the full-time equivalent for the position in this for the position in this example the program advocate will work 50 percent of the time on this program so then finally, you want to include a brief description of the line item and explain how it furthers the goals and objectives of the program. This is a brief description. For the benefit calculations, you need to include the benefit rate. In this example, the rate is 22% multiplied by the total salaries of the employees in the budget that received benefits. For this example, it's 200,000 and finally, you'll want to include a brief description of what benefits are included. So like right here, they have FICA, Medicare, health, dental. So unless you're paying the volunteer a salary, you should have them in the operating section. Volunteers are also captured in the budget category A. The first element needed is the rate that you have valued your volunteers at. Please know that this rate cannot exceed what it costs your agency to have a staff person doing the, doing the same job. And that you can include both salary and benefits when calculating the volunteer rate. In this example, the value of the volunteers is $12 an hour multiplied by the number of hours to be charged to the, to the grant. In this example, it's 1,200 hours, and then include a description of the activities the volunteer will, will be doing. Now we're going to show you a few operating ex expenses examples. So operating uh, some of the so volunteers that are being charged for the following per diem, gas, mileage should be titled as shown in the slide. Title as volunteer, title of what they're being charged for in this example they're being charged to do to per diem and the name number of training they're attending again the elements in the gold bubbles need to be included in each calculation for each line item for example we have postage the amount of postage is 250 per month multiplied by the duration in this example, it's 12 months, which probably matches the length of the performance period multiplied by how much the postage will be charged to the grant. Rent is another very common operating expense. For rent, you'll need to add up the full-time equivalents or FTEs in the budget category A 
personnel services in this example, we have four and a half full time FTEs. Then multiply the four and a half FTEs by 125 square feet per FTE, which is what's allowed in the subrecipient handbook. And then multiply that by the amount you pay for your rent per square foot. Please note the two dollar that that two dollars is the up to amount or the maximum you're actually uh, you you can actually uh, rate in your calculations. If your landlord charges you 65 cents per square foot, then that's your rate and you need to use that. And finally, you multiply the duration in this example. It's 12 months. If you're claiming indirect costs, this award for this award, please make sure you're calculating the total correctly. A common mistake is multiplying the total award amount by the indirect cost rate. This is not how you get this is not how you calculate the indirect cost. First, first you need to calculate your total direct cost to do to do this at a personnel salary, wages, benefits, operational costs, and up to 25,000 of your second tier sub award. But do not include any distorting costs such as equipment rent, capital expenditures, and second tier sub award beyond the first $25,000. In this example, after doing the calculations, they got $233,215. Once you figured out your, your, your direct cost, you simply multiply that by the, by the ICR, federally approved ICR. In this case, case it's 10%. So please make sure that the ICR matches what you entered in section seven of the face sheet, and that if you're claiming a federally approved ICR, you must include a copy of your, your approved ICR in the negotiation, negotiation agreement with your application. Some final reminders about your budget. So please be sure to refer, to refer to the RFP to identify required and prohibited expenses and that you build your budget and that you build your budget accordingly. So be sure to use the whole dollar amounts only. Often your budget's off by like a dollar. It's due to rounding errors. So please be sure you're checking the amounts entered in your budget columns. Please include expenses in the correct. Yes, yeah, so please include expenses in the correct category. And lastly, all budget line items require a justification and a calculation. A request for proposal requires a budget narrative as well. So the budget narrative, which allows a subrecipient to provide detail details about their budget. The budget narrative typically includes how the budget supports objectives and activities, the need for administrative costs, and the necessity for subcontractors. The most common mistake we see with the budget narratives are that sometimes they don't match what's on the budget pages. For example, let's say you submitted a proposal packet and during the review, your specialist determines that several corrections are needed to your budget pages. You make those corrections for your, you make the corrections for your specialist, but now your budget narrative doesn't match. So please remember every time your budget pages change are updated, your budget narrative must be updated as well. They need to match. Next is the programmatic narrative where you provide details about how you will meet the objectives of the program. Please be sure you're reading the, your RFP and that your narrative addresses each of the questions from the RFP. We have often seen applicants use the same narrative that had been used the previous year, even perhaps for another grant that does not address any or all of the questions of the RFP. Next is the Grants Mas Management Assessment Form. For Title II CFR Section 200.332, Cal OES is required to eval evaluate the risk of noncompliance with federal st statutes, regulations, and grant terms and condition posed by each subrecipient of pass-through fundings. This assessment is made in order to determine and provide the appropriate level of technical assistance, training, and grant oversight to the applicant for the award referenced above.
The questions are related to your organization's experience in the management of federal grant subawards. This questionnaire must be completed and turned in with your grant proposal materials. For purposes of completing this questionnaire, grant manager is the individual who has primary responsibility for the day-to-day -day administrations of the grant. The bookkeeper accounting staff means the individuals who respons who's, has a responsibility of reviewing and determining expenditures to be charged to the grant. An organization, an organization refers to the applicant applying for the award and or the government implementing agency as applicable. We just spent a, a significant amount of time talking about the eight required forms for each request for proposal we release, but sometimes additional forms may apply. So be sure to check part five of your request for proposal to find out if any forms may apply to your organization. Any additional forms may apply to your organization. So, uh, so some final thoughts, some final things to remember. All forms have instructions. So make sure you're reading the instructions before asking for help. Uh, use the forms from the website. Those will be the most current versions. Uh, the checklist that comes with the request for proposal will tell you which forms you're which which forms are required. And then lastly, email Listo. Oh, not lastly, but email Listos Grants at Listos Grants at caloes.ca.goe if you have any questions. We're here to help. And lastly, use the checklist in part five for the request for proposal. And this concludes the grant sub award proposal training. Thank you guys. Thank you, Edmond. So, so yes, this concludes the, the request for proposal and application overview training, and as well as the um, grant sub award proposal training, the second slides as well. Um, just a reminder that the presentation has been recorded and it will be available for on-demand viewing later. So go ahead, if you would like to get a copy of this, please email listosgrants at caloes.ca.gov and um, ask for that those uh, the recording and we'll be happy to provide that to you. Um, if you, again, have any more questions, I don't see any more in the, in the chat box, so... If you have any more questions after the fact, please feel free to email us as well. We have someone there that is um, working that inbox five days a week, all day. So, um, you know, we look forward to your, your questions. And that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for attending, and we look forward to receiving your application. And good luck. Bye.